By the way, the first time ever in the history of the Vatican that lay people at such a senior level have set as full equals with cardinals, the same voting rights as cardinals on a decision-making organism in the Vatican. They are all world-class financial professionals. Beneath that, he's created a secretariat for the economy, which will do the day-to-day -day work of, of enforcing transparency and accountability, doing quarterly performance reviews, doing annual audits, making sure there are two sets of eyes and everything and so on. And to break the grip of this old guard culture, if you had said to me, John, a year ago, if you had come to me and said, give me the one cardinal in the world who might actually have the spy, okay, that is the strength of character to stare down the old guard and to bulldoze through the kind of changes needed to modernize the Vatican's financial operation. Give me one guy who might be able to pull that off. <clears throat> in the abstract, I would have said, it's Cardinal George Pell of Sydney, Australia. And that is exactly the guy that Pope Francis named to run this secretary. Now, why Pell? Here's the thing you need to understand about George Pell. Okay, back in the day, when Pell was a teenager, he was a rising star in Australian rules football. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever seen an Aussie football match, but it's NFL-style hits with no pads. Okay, it's a rare game that one of these guys is not carted off in a stretcher, and back in the day, Pell was usually the guy putting him on that stretcher. I mean, or to put it differently, I mean, this is basically Brian Urlacher in a castle that we're talking about. Okay, the mind of a theologian, the heart of a linebacker, okay, is where George Pell is coming from. Uh, tough as nails, utterly not going to be deterred. Uh, he was one of the leaders of the guerrilla insurrection in the conclave of March 2013, led to this referendum for change. Uh, and so he's determined to see it through. And then beyond that secretariat, the third piece of the puzzle is there is now an, an independent auditor general that reports directly to the Pope, checking up on the council and the secretariat. So you've legitimately got two sets of eyes on everything. Again, I know all of this sounds like heavy insider baseball. I know it doesn't sound scintillating. But I will tell you that in any system, and particularly in the Vatican, there is no way to break the power of the old guard more effectively than taking away their power of the purse. And in effect, that's what Francis has done. I believe that a year from now, we will be in a position to answer one of those questions that heretofore has always been one of the great mysteries of the faith, okay, like the precise nature of the Godhead, okay, or precisely how many saints are there in heaven up there with unanswerable enigmatic questions has always been exactly how much money does the Vatican have? Okay, I think a year from now George Pell is going to have an answer to that question and I think he's going to give it to the world and when that happens we will be living in a new heaven and a new earth. And the, the, the short answer to the question, I think reform is real. Oh, the why did Benedict quit question. Well, look, uh, I have lived uh, in Italy. I lived in Italy full time for more than a decade. I've been in and out of Italy uh, most of my adult life. Even though I don't have a drop of Italian blood in my veins, I think of myself as quasi Italian in Sacco. Huh? I mean, I'm, I'm basically an adopted son of Italy. I have a hard time functioning outside of Italian airspace. That said, God help the Italians, they have never seen a conspiracy theory they are not prepared to believe. Okay, uh, and so, you know, when something happens, it can't just be for the stated reasons. I mean, they're, do you know the Italians are the only people I know who actually have a word, a single word, dietrologia, which means the study of what's behind the scenes. I mean, it's telling that we need a sentence to get that out of our mouths, they need one word. Okay, and so there's always got to be some massive conspiracy behind the scenes. For the most part, when Benedict said he was resigning for reasons of age and health, I take him at his word. I mean, those of us who were covering him had noted a marked decline uh, in the guy's energy level, a marked increase in his frailty, that he tired more easily, you know, so forth and so on. You know, after uh, he took uh, his trip, uh, his last major uh, overseas trip, he basically needed an entire month to recover from it. I mean, if you notice, you know, he would continue to do the audiences in the Angelus, but he had radically pared back his daily calendar, and he wasn't being seen in public, you know, other than those, you know, twice-weekly occasions. So uh, I have no problem believing that it was mostly age and health. Further, 
you know, I had all of a sudden, and I, by the way, you can, you can Google this, you can, track, you can check my track record on this. I had said well before February 11th, uh, 2013, that I found it credible that Benedict would resign in a way I had never found it credible that John Paul II would resign. And that's because there was a basic difference between these two guys. I mean, John Paul II, you have to understand, was at heart a Carmelite mystic. Okay, uh, and, and he saw himself in his papacy as participating in a broader cosmic mystery. I mean, you're talking about a pope who was profoundly convinced that on May 13, 1981, the Virgin Mary changed the flight path of a bullet to keep him in office. That was the assassination attempt in St. Peter's Square. It was also the feast of Our Lady of Fatima. Okay? I've seen the Roman police sketches. I mean, if you look at where Mahatkar Aliyaka was standing, when he fired that second shot, if it had followed a straight line, that bullet should have ended up in the Pope's heart. It, did, it ended up about three inches to the left in his ribcage. And on the first anniversary, that is the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima in 1982, John Paul went to the shrine of Our Lady. He took the bullet doctors had removed from his, from his uh, ribcage. He placed it in, this, in the crown of the statue of the Virgin in, in Fatima to thank her for saving his life and saving his papacy. Now, if that's your worldview, Okay? I don't think you ever get out of bed one morning and just say, you know what, I've had enough. I'm going to hit the golf course and write my memoirs. You know, let somebody else win this. It's just, it's not... Now, you know, Ratzinger, although, you know, theologically and philosophically, the two men were obviously very much in sync, Ratzinger had a very different, has a very different personality. And, and part of it is a much more kind of realistic, feet firmly planted on the earth view of himself. Okay? I mean, the proof of this was, back, back in 97, this is, of course, when he was still at the Holy Office before he was elected to the papacy, he, was, uh, he did a book-length interview with a German journalist named Peter Zabel. And one of the questions Zabel asked then Cardinal Ratzinger was, could you explain to us John Paul's vision of a new springtime of evangelization, right? That was a phrase that John Paul liked to use, the new springtime of evangelization. So Ratzinger says, yes, uh, the Holy Father believes that the first millennium was a millennium of Christian unity, that the second millennium was a millennium of Christian division, and that the third millennium will be a millennium, a, a millennium of new Christian unity that will lead to a new flowering of missionary effort. And then he adds this delicious sentence at the end. Ratzinger said, myself, I don't really see it. <laughs> you know? So I think he always had a more realistic, you know, sort of sense of things. Uh, and, and further, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I think Ratzinger gave us some clear hints that he was considering this. I mean, he did another book like the interview with the same journalist in 2010, in which he said that under some circumstances, a pope would not only have the right to resign, but even the duty to resign. And twice he went up to Abruzzo, uh, to, in, in which during those trips he visited the, uh, the tomb of Celestine V, the last pope to freely resign the office in the 13th century. And in one of those visits to the tomb of Celestine, he actually took the papal stole off his shoulders and put it on the tomb. Okay, so when you look back, I think it's clear that this had been in his mind for a long time. Uh, so that said, uh, you know, I buy that age and health uh, were the primary factors. However, I would just add this foot. Okay. I think you have to ask the question, why was Benedict XVI so tired in February 2013? And I think part of it was because serially over the eight years of his papacy, he understood himself to be a teaching pope. He was trying to make a lofty argument to the world about the intersection of faith and reason and the role of religion in a postmodern secular culture. And he repeatedly got dragged out of his comfort zone to put out administrative fires. Okay, some of which were self-inflicted, and, and some of them crashed in on him from the outside. Uh, but, you know, I mean, a, a, a teaching pope who was having to deal with the Holocaust denying bishop affair and Vatty leaks and the sex abuse stuff and all of that, I, I just think, cumulatively, that took a toll on the man. Okay, so, I mean, you, you, if you want to ask the question, why was he figuring, why was he feeling so exhausted? Uh, in February 2013, that it, that it pushed him over the line to make this decision. I think some of it had to do with eight very difficult years in which he was repeatedly having to spend most of his papacy outside of his natural comforts. Other questions, or are we reaching a natural way? 
I th- do we have one more time for one more? Yeah, just stand up, it's fine. So if you didn't hear the questions, are there skeletons in Pope Francis's closet from Argentina, particularly about his complicity with the military junta in the 1970s? Uh, look, I mean, you never know what might pop out somewhere down the line, but I, at this point, I think that bone has been pretty thoroughly chewed over, uh, and I think the conclusion of most fair-minded people uh, is that there simply isn't any true skeleton in the closet from that period. I mean, the accusation, as you may know, uh, this accusation first surfaced when Bergoglio was a candidate for the papacy in 2005 and then was recycled in 2013, was that he had denounced two liberal Jesuits in Argentina to the security services, which led to them uh, being arrested and tortured. Now, one of those, both of them were subsequently released. One of them died in the 80s. The other uh, is now living uh, in Germany. Uh, approached for a comment in all this, what that German Jesuit has said uh, is that he basically does not believe that Bergoglio denounced him. He does not believe that was Bergoglio was responsible for him getting rounded up. What he has learned subsequently is that once he had been arrested, Bergoglio tried to get him out. Uh, and so these guys, that, you know, Bergoglio had him at the Doma Santa Marta in Rome. They spent a day together. They celebrated mass together, exchanged the kiss of peace. So there's kind of been a, a reconciliation. I spent a lot of time in Argentina working on this question of what Bergoglio's record had been during the, the years of the dictatorship. Uh, I think it is fair to say that he was not an enthusiast of the, the first stirrings of liberation theology. Okay? But this was not because Bergoglio had any issue with the option for the poor. I mean, he himself was a, bishop, a priest and a bishop who very much opted for the poor. What you have to understand is that in Argentina in the, in the 70s and early 80s, what liberation theology meant in practice was a movement called the Montaneros, which was an armed guerrilla movement in which some liberal priests, including some of his fellow Jesuits, were either taking up guns themselves or blessing the guys who were, okay, and, and kind of sprinkling, sprinkling holy water on armed leftist insurrection. All right, now Bergoglio thought that was the wrong route to go. So he was not opposed to what we now know as liberation theology, okay? He was opposed to what he perceived to be the politicizing of the church and doing so in service of violence, okay? I th- and therefore, I think he kind of got a bad rap. Uh, but in any event, that reputation followed him around, you know, as, as somebody who had been on the conservative dis- decide. Uh, of the early debates over liberation theology. I, I think it is fair to say he was never publicly identified with the opposition to the junta, but he was never publicly identified with the support for it either. Basically, he was a guy who did his head down, kept his head down, uh, tried as much as he could to protect members of his own flock, uh, and tried as much as he could to model in his own pastoral choices a kind of nonviolent, merciful option for the poor. I'm not worried about skeletons. By the way, I'm also not worried about skeletons with the closet on the sex abuse front. You may know there have been a few cases that have been laid at Bergoglio's feet of guys who were accused of abuse in Argentina, but where these cases were either swept under the rug or they at least weren't zealously prosecuted. Thing is, if you look at these cases, some of them unfolded while he was president of the bishops' conference, but none of them were actually ever his priests. Okay, so if somebody dropped the ball, it wasn't Bergoglio. I mean, I think it's fair to say that Bergoglio is on a learning curve with the sex abuse stuff, uh, but I think, you know, he's committed to moving the ball. This new commission he's created that includes a victim of sex abuse, uh, I think, is, is proof of that. And like with the financial stuff, I am more confident now that there will be real reform, particularly on the accountability front in the Francis era, uh, than in any shot we've had in the previous Actually, I will tell you, from a marketing point of view, one of the reasons, because the world is now lousy with, with insta-biographies of Pope Francis, one of the reasons that none of them are selling uh, is because personality books typically work only when you've got some kind of smoking gun revelation, or when you can kind of do the Bob Woodward, you know, inside the White House, you know, Bush and Colin Powell sitting around a table kind of thing. Uh, there is no smoking gun about Francis, that's the thing. 
right? Uh, so the winning strategy for you know literary journalism about him is going to have to be the second strategy. Okay? Uh, listen, since we reach uh, the, uh, the the natural end of all this, let me say one last thing before we all go home. In addition to thank you for your hospitality, which is. Uh, I want to say I want this to be the beginning of a conversation among us and not the end, okay? Uh, so let me just say, if there is ever any way I can be of help uh, to someone here tonight, I would be delighted to do that. I don't actually know what that means, but, you know, if you're in an adult faith group someplace or whatever, and then there's some Vatican rumor circulating, or, you know, you're teaching catechism and there's some dumb Pope question that you think I might be able to answer, I mean, for God's sakes, ladies and gentlemen, if you're coming to Rome and you want restaurant recommendations, <laughs> this is where I truly shine. <laughs> and yes, I am aware that it's a real burden of my office that so much of it is done over lengthy Italian meals, but I want you to know I'm over there carrying the cross for all of you. <laughs> anyway, whatever it is, uh, of course, as you know, I've got a column in the Boston Globe. If you go on the website, or just Google or whatever, you know, John Allen, all things Catholic, Globe. Um, you'll find my email address uh, at the bottom, uh, and I do respond to that. Now, if you're going to do that, you know, please put St. Catherine's Parish or something in it, so I don't think you're the seventh Nigerian prince today who's going to give me 30 million bucks if I just give him my bank account details. <laughs> but, you know, assuming you permeate my spam filter, if, if I can be of service, I'd be delighted to do that. I mean, if I'm going to run around talking this, this rep, uh, about the need to promote a, a unified response to the new energies of the Francis era and all that. You know, obviously I have to walk my own talk. So if I can be of service to you, I'd be delighted to do that. Again, thank you for your hospitality here tonight. God bless you.